I'm 95 years old. So with that span of time, you can just imagine that I remember President Aguinaldo <laughs> all the way to President Duterte. <laughs> so that's my advantage over most people in this land today because I have seen history from the time of the Americans all the way to now. History uh, was totally distorted to favor one group. And it's, it, it is unfortunately continuing. That is why exercises yeah. such as these are and, important. Uh, little by little, the truth will come out. Well, I, I, I'm I, glad that uh, you have asked me to join this uh, conversation so that uh, at least we can somehow correct the distortions of history. I am very grateful to you. And I'm willing to challenge anybody uh, here in this country to debate with me about the events. We put this together, really, because of the, the mail that I have been receiving in my uh, social media. And the millennials have a different approach, it seems, to the events of, of history. Uh, the history of your lifetime, for that matter. And uh, the millennials seem to want to know what it is behind the decisions that my father and the members of his government made in, his time, in the time of the Marcos administrations. And so we thought the best, uh, most authoritative person that we could find would be you, mm. as you were not only in the middle of the action, as it were, but uh, you were part of the decision-making process of many of the important events that, uh, that occurred. During the first two years, three years of martial law, you can open your window, leave your house, nobody will touch it. Mm. That's how peaceful the country was. So it, 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 is, it wasn't the typical, it wasn't the typical uh, country under military rule where you had tanks in no, the streets no, 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 and no, you no. had soldiers people were pulling free. people out of their homes. Of course, homes. in the beginning we had curfew. Yes, we had, yes, I remember that. We had to give grant passes. Mm. So Tito, the, the account you're giving as to the, the approach, the build up towards the declaration of martial law and the actual implementation of it and the enforcement of uh, the uh, military rule. Uh, it's very different from what we are hearing. And for, for you, you know, for example, I mean, I, I hear it too, but of course, it's a different, you come from a different perspective. What is the biggest fallacy that uh, young people now are being fed about the, about the, uh, the well, reasons behind and the actual events of martial law? They claim that we killed a lot of people. And that's why when I was interviewed by someone uh, some time ago, I challenged her, name me one that we executed, what we killed other than Lim Seng. What was the accusation? Was that uh, the summarily that, uh, that executed? That we had 70,000 oh, persons I hear those arrested, numbers which, was not, which, which was not true. Hmm. Maybe if they will include the, car, the people who, were, who violated curfew huh. and the jaywalkers, maybe you can reach <laughs> that number. <laughs> But say anyone who was people, people can go out at night, they can go out and fish, they can go out to farm, they can go out. They were free, in fact. Hmm. Of course, if you are a, a member of the rebel, rebel group or a, a warlord or a, 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 who violated a, crimi, a criminal uh, a law, hmm. you have to be arrested whether you have martial law or not. It, it, it sometimes, uh, I, I'm mystified sometimes by uh, the, the lack of understanding of the simple fact that if you attack the government, you attack the state, the state needs to defend itself. Of course. And that, uh, that, 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 that's why fighting would break uh, out. And that's name, why... Me, name me one person that was arrested because of political or religious belief during that period. None. They were all they for criminal acts. one person that uh, was arrested simply because he criticized President Marcos. None. But there were a lot of critics still uh, very, very vociferous and very uh, speaking out against, uh, against him and his administration, yes. even during the martial law, during under, uh, when the country was under it, martial it, law. Jovi Salonga, for instance. Oh, 
He was involved in the light of fire movement and many others. They were very few were arrested. And they were released. They were inconvenient, uh, inconvenience for a while, but they were released. The late Pepe Jock, no, he didn't want to be released. Uh, just, I told Pepe, <laughs> just sign anything and uh, just, just get out of here. <laughs> I told him. <laughs> All of that seems to have been lost uh, in the accounts that we hear now. Well, I cannot blame the so-called millennial when were, they were born in 1980, no? Let's say, oh, oh yeah. wow. Well, they did not deal. know anything. They just, what they, they know is what they read or heard. And, it is uh, and uh, they read something that was based on inaccurate facts. During martial law, there were no massacres like what happened in Benjola during the supposed uh, democratic government of Jorge Aquino. Maybe you could explain to these young people uh, hmm. the approach that, uh, that you took uh, to governance. Kasi, kasi Tito, di, di, na, I remember when I was young, I would listen to, to my father's speeches and lagi kong naririnig the phrase nation building. Hmm. And I have not heard that phrase since 1986. And it does not seem to be the priority or the, the, the guiding principle in governance anymore. You mentioned about nation building, which was a battle cry of the Marcos uh, government. That's right. Tito. That was all included in the uh, national plan that was prepared mm -hmm. by the brain trust of uh, your, uh, your dad. And that covers infrastructure, agriculture, uh, uh, energy, and education. And that's why when we started with agriculture, he established irrigation canals, mm. especially in the north and in many parts of the country. And then he went into electrification. The national electrification that we have started with your father. He started the geothermal, geothermal. sources of energy in the country today, which is uh, helping the economy. Mm -hmm. And then later on, as a part of his uh, national plan, education of the people. And that's why he created the system of state universities that expanded the educational system in the country and made education cheaper for the people. And so many others. He introduced land reform. Mm. That's why he, he was very conscious of uh, the sale of Hacienda Luisita <laughs> uh, during the Garcia administration. Garcia. This was a part of his land reform program. Proposed the establishment of a nuclear plant, mm. which was derailed by Cory Aquino because of their anger and revenge against the Marcos administration. Dito, you mentioned the uh, lobbying of the uh, big landowners, the Hacienda owners, and uh, uh, for the exemptions from the land reform. But the, that, I think the term that, uh, in that around that time was we were beginning to hear my father speaking out against the group of oligarchs. Correct. That were controlling many segments of the economy Correct. and were not uh, in, uh, uh, were not uh, helping or supporting the national program. Oligarchies existed during the time of your dad and even before that. Mm -hmm. And even now, they are still around. They control the economy, they control the agriculture because they had all the haciendas, they control the communication. They want to control even government. If you will remember, you have to talk to interest groups to be able to run for public office in those days. Control Meralco, they control the media, they control the, uh, the newspapers uh, and uh, the radio, uh, oh, many, many facets of in the industry. They, the industrialization of the country was controlled by the so-called oligarchs of the of the land. So, so the, this is one of the elements that uh, that that uh, pushed the government towards the declaration of martial law yes. in '72. Uh, uh, apart from the fact that uh, indeed there was a need of it, because 
what was the social condition of the land at this point. We were dealing with separatism in Mindanao. We were dealing with a very strong communist party. We were dealing with the onset of drugs, menace in the, menace in the country. We were dealing with landlord, this, uh, political warlords over the land and the, the high criminality in the land. And what was our instrument of power at that uh, point? We had only less than 50,000 in the armed services. That included the constabulary, the army, the air force, the navy, and the coast guard. And uh, our weapons were carbines oh. and uh, garants of uh, World War World II War vintage, II. World War II vintage against the Belgian Falls, the Kalashnikov or KK-47 of uh, our uh, adversaries. I think nakakalimutan dito the, the extent of this warlordism and the, the size of the private armies. The, the size of uh, firearms in the hands of the civilian population was much more than the uh, capability of the armed forces of the Philippines and the, uh, the constabulary. When martial law was declared, the, there was an we harvested yeah. about 600,000 guns all over the country of all kinds. As, a, as opposed to our 50,000... Uh, Less than 50,000 to be exact. I think we had only about 48,000. Uniformed services. Yeah. So the, 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 the people do not realize the extent of the warlordism because I don't and think we have the apart, modern equivalent. Apart from, the, from these uh, factors that I told you, their political organization, especially the pol uh, political organization of the uh, Communist Party of the Philippines, was uh, extensive. They have a united front that was very strong until now. That uh, united front is operating through the NDF. Oh, they co covered labor, the universities, academy, farmers, fishermen, women, teachers, all over. They infiltrated even the church. And we, uh, we did not only have the armed elements of the Communist Party and the separatists, we have the Christian Liberation Army. Even I, the church was involved. So in, in, in that time, the government assessed that it was the largest security problem was the communist uh, insurgency. Correct. And that yes. is that the, the, the martial law was really a response to that correct, very... Correct, correct. One of the reasons why President Marcos finally declared martial law, uh, very few people will remember this now, was because there, there was already a working coalition between the Liberal Party and the New People's Army, the... New, new Communist Party of the Philippines said that by season at this point. And President Marcos real, realized that the there country was too fragile with a very limited military capability to contain the problem. But this is something new. Did, we, I did not know there was a formal agreement or yeah. a, between a political my, oh my party. God. Nino and Aquino and I met in the house of Ramon Silay in Urdaneta village. He was my neighbor. Uh, Paul Aquino, is he still alive? Mm. He was present in that meeting. He was the one who reported to me that uh, he had a meeting with the leadership of the Communist Party and they were uh, discussing a coalition government. But this was together with the, with the Liberal Party at the time? He was a member of the Liberal Party. But the Liberal Party hierarchy was, uh, was part of this, uh, this arrangement? Or? When President Marcos uh, Chara finally confronted them with information, they refused to talk to President Marcos. I didn't proclaim martial law alone. Uh, it is made to appear as if uh, I, I just... Uh, Signed the decree and said, I impose martial law on each and every one of you. No. I ask the legislature to please pass a law proclaiming martial law because there was anarchy in the country. Now, uh, let me uh, say this. The opposition was strong. And uh, they were members of the Security Council and somehow they adopted the resolution which... Uh, required that there be a unanimous vote for the armed forces to be able to move 
And therefore, the armed forces was immobilized. At the same time, I asked uh, um, the um, opposition party to come and join me in a coalition government. I offered one half of the cabinet. And of course, they laughed at me and said, why should we join you? We're going to take over the government. By the time you are through with the exercise, you're dead. How was the, how was the evolution of the thinking within the administration? to finally come to the decision that uh, my father declared martial law in Because uh, it started when uh, they invented the Jabida massacre. <laughs> invented I say invented Dita. because until now I, I have not heard of anyone who complained about anybody being massacred in Corridor. No one. The only one who was, uh, who appeared as a member of the Trainees, supposedly the Muslim trainees in Corregidor was that fellow who swam, swam across the Corregidor to uh, Cavite, which was the invention of Montano and uh, Nino Yaquino. Uh, that is, but, and because of that uh, outburst, political outburst of Nino, we lost Saba. Saba. Uh, and then that Jabita massacre, uh, the, the rail, uh, what do you call this, effect injured the political stature of Damascus regime, mm. followed by the Plaza Miranda grenading in 1971. Mm. And because of that Plaza Miranda, I was a victim. I was a candidate afterwards for uh, senator and I lost because we were blamed for Plaza Miranda, although that was the handiwork of the Communist Party. The disorder that was brought about by them, by the left especially, was uh, too much to bear by, this, by the country at that point. As a Secretary of Defense, I had to fight both the Muslims in Mindanao and the Christians. Yes, and then at the same time, there were also datos who, were, who rose against the government. The group of the MNLF were sponsored by Malaysia because of the limitations uh, imposed by the government, the regime, or the situation, political situation in the country before martial law. The hands of the president was limited, so he finally decided in the, after he was re-elected to impose martial law. He asked me to study his powers under the commander-in-chief provision. I was secretary of justice at the time. The declaration and the implementation in the very first days, I was not here, I was uh, abroad studying. And I remember that uh, I, was, I just got the news uh, from a phone call. My father had mentioned it previously, and he said that things are getting pretty bad. And uh, he had spoken about uh, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. And after that, uh, he was talking about uh, that uh, we hope, he had hoped not to declare martial law. But I, he you got, know, actually, I got the news that your uh, dad asked me to prepare this study in December of 1969 mm -hmm. because he was anticipating that he will uh, finally have to face mm -hmm. the music. When we finished the studies about January of 1970, uh, uh, at this point the president transferred me to the Department of National Defense. Ah. And then he waited from 1970. 1970, 71, he allowed the election of 1971 to go through, where we were, the nation was experiencing violence and uh, disorder. Because he, he, as he did not want to declare it. He was hesitating mm. to, to use his uh, commander-in-chief powers until finally in 1972 he decided my uh, countrymen, as of the 21st of uh, this month, I signed Proclamation Number 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. So the, it is, it's not uh, remembered very well, or it is not uh, well uh, documented, or it is not well uh, disseminated about the, how, how large and how severe the problem was uh, of the communist uprising and the, uh, well, we, we still see the fighting in Mindanao, but it's over a different uh, 
uh, different we ideology. Were, we now. were able to arrest all of the leaders, mm. including uh, uh, Jose Maria Sison, Juliet, uh, the wife, and several of the leading commanders of uh, the Communist Party and emasculated the organization until later on when uh, we had, uh, after Elsa, Corey restored the problem because he, he released she all released the leaders all of, of the Communist leaders. Party and then including Father Balweg mm -mm. of the Cordilleras mm -mm. and then brought back Miswari from, uh, from Saudi exile yes. to revive the MNL problem. And, and, and was there uh, a reason stated that for is why, where why, why I they parted did ways with <laughs> <laughs> with Corey? Oh. In, in the face of all of this, I think we moved, we come to the question: what, How did you think Corey did as president? Did you think she be she well, she she? Well, I'm not here, so I didn't know much about the details. You know, Wang Bong. Having been uh, involved in the cabinet of uh, President Marcos, and I'm not saying this to denigrate anybody, I was uh, dismayed when in my first uh, cabinet meeting with uh, Corey, he did not make any decision. I'm sorry to say this, but I realized I, in that first meeting that I had in that cabinet that the president that succeeded Jordan did not know anything about governance.